I don't think we realize just how stressful these times are. When someone experiences the stress response, um, almost every single organ in the body is affected. Not every call is going to be a dangerous call, but every call has a potential for danger. Really? What's going on with you? You're popping tums like candy? You're asking me for aspirin all the time? Do you need help? What's such a shame is that these are human beings that are really not allowed to have normal human expressions to these tragic events. When anybody has um, stress that their normal coping skills can't adapt to, they're gonna start seeing a breakdown in just every bit of their whole wellness, if you would. Police officers experience frequent and ongoing stressors in their work on a daily basis. These range from the stress of everyday calls to stress associated with critical incidents, such as violent crimes, shootings, and mass disasters. While stressors like these are unavoidable and a part of a peace officer's job, stress can be recognized, controlled, and need not necessarily lead to chronic mental or physical problems. I'm Mark Bailey. I'm a former full-time and current reserve police officer and I'll be your host for this training. The purpose of this training is for officers to develop a better understanding of stress, identify the types of stress, as well as the symptoms, and learn how to better deal with the effects of stress on themselves, as well as helping those around them. Segments of this training include, what is stress? The causes of stress. Recognizing symptoms of stress. The impact of stress developing coping and resilience skills, resources for stress management, and some final thoughts. We in law enforcement so many times prepare our guys for how to fight, how to, how to be officer safety conscious. But yet we don't teach them long term of how to survive the whole career of law enforcement. A lot of things made more sense to me uh, coming back from combat because I realized, you know, my fellow officer out there on the streets, um, they're up against the same things we were up against in combat every day. The stressors of the what ifs, the unknown, and will I go home tonight? And that's a huge stress to put on a human body. Generally, when they go into the academy and all their training, they'll, they'll deal with what we call the physical body armor. They know how to take care and protect themselves. But a lot of times, they don't learn how to deal with the psychological body armor, how to protect themselves emotionally and mentally. We all experience stress on a daily basis. Some of the top 10 stressors for the average person include relationship issues, financial issues, and the stress associated with losing one's job. Likewise, officers experience these everyday stresses, as well as numerous stressors specific to a law enforcement career. Shift work alone can have a tremendous impact on an officer's body, as well as a profound effect on one's home life. On a daily basis, officers encounter human pain and suffering, and controlling their emotions and protecting the lives of others, even when their own safety is at stake, is a daily challenge for peace officers. Normal stress isn't necessarily harmful in manageable amounts. However, when stress exceeds a person's ability to cope with it, then it can become a serious problem. In this section, we will take a look at the biology of stress and talk about what your body experiences in relation to stress and stressful situations. We will also define and discuss cumulative stress as well as critical incident stress. A stress in the law enforcement world for a police officer is unique uh, from a lot of different types of professions because uh, the amount of hours that we spend in exposure to danger. So not every call is going to be a dangerous call, but every call has a potential for danger. When we're dealing with law enforcement, they're in a, what's called a hypervigilant state. Uh, they're always looking out for their safety for themselves, their partner, as well as the community. 
And generally, that hypervigilance state ends up uh, putting them into physical stress. Law enforcement people are much more subject to fight or flight responses simply because of the nature of their job. And so they're more likely to get into circumstances for which the body is, is prepared, but only for very brief periods. What we're good at dealing with is the brief crisis. When the crises are repetitive or when they are you know, ex overextended periods of time for the same crisis, that's when we run into trouble. As soon as they put their uniform on, they start, their body starts recognizing some small measures of, of flight or flight. And so they start producing chemicals to help manage and deal with those things. So you're, at any point in time during your shift, you're under the influence of some of those different chemicals that your body's manufacturing. And these are the things that cause stress. When someone experiences the stress response, um, almost every single organ in the body is affected. Everything from the brain, the liver, the heart, the digestive system, it all gets um, affected by a threat. And that's what the stress response is. It's always in, in reaction to a threat. Normal stress is something that everybody goes through. and. And it's just a part of life, and that's okay. What the problem is, is if you continue to let stress build up, and you don't manage it, and you aren't aware of it, and you're not aware of the effects on your body. Well, cumulative, by its definition of the word, something that's adding on top of another. So if you go from one incident, and you don't bounce back to your baseline, which would be your normal behavior, then you add another incident to that, and another beyond that, eventually those add up. And the accumulation of all those things then start to take a toll. When officers don't allow themselves in the aftermath of an incident to experience the stress and then um, work through it, when they continue to just push it down, it tends to build on them over years. And that is where we get the cumulative stress. With the constant exposure to stress from the day-to-day -day situations law enforcement personnel experience, the effects on an officer can begin to build up over time. Cumulative stress is often subtle and many times may be overlooked. However, over time, cumulative stress can have a dramatic effect on an officer's mental health and physical well-being. Another type of stress that affects officers is critical incident stress, which is oftentimes caused by a traumatic incident that has sufficient power to overwhelm an officer's ability to cope. Unlike cumulative stress that builds up over time, critical incident stress is often the result of a single isolated incident. So a critical incident is something that takes us by, by surprise. It's sort of a, a shock to the nervous system and it disrupts our equilibrium. By definition, a critical incident is any time a normal person is put into a highly abnormal situation that their normal coping mechanisms are overwhelmed and they become dysfunctional. And the interventions are specifically designed to help them to manage the stress of the incident. Critical incidents bring on abnormal reactions, which are very normal, but it feels abnormal. And if we can grab everybody that's scene specific and let them understand that everybody's feeling something similar, then it normalizes it even more and mitigates them getting back to normalcy quicker. When we experience a critical incident, um, the underlying feeling is a feeling of powerlessness. And that's a feeling that we really don't like to experience, but especially police officers don't like to experience that. So what we do is we revert to guilt. So we fool ourselves into thinking that we had some control over the situation. And what's dangerous about this phenomenon is that when guilt is internalized, it turns into depression. Once you've been exposed to a critical incident, it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. It doesn't even mean that that incident in and of itself will cause a trigger in you that absolutely needs therapy or needs dealing with. I would say that in every event, you should be monitoring yourself. You should be asking yourself days, you know, moments later, days later, how do I feel? How am I sleeping? Am I having any cognitive problems? More importantly, people around our peers, we need to form together and, and be watching each other for changes in our baseline. We kind of expect weird and crazy things in combat when those weird and crazy things happen after combat. 
that can really mess us up, unless you've been warned. This profession's only been uh, compared to one other profession, and that is the military soldier in the time of combat. And why is that? And that is one reason, the unknown risks. Because every other profession out there has some kind of risk. Electricians can be electrocuted, firemen can get burned, but our officers do not know who is always the bad guy. And so those unknown risks, add on to just the everyday stressors that everybody else has in their jobs. We do see people at their maddest, baddest, and saddest, and that has an effect on us. We kind of become receptacles for a lot of toxic emotions, and, and we put them in our bodies, and you know, you have to think of it kind of in a common sense way. When you see people constantly and, and at their worst, um, it's gonna have an effect on us. The causes of stress for an officer are many. From a routine traffic stop to critical incidents, officers are physically under varying amounts of stress. And this stress doesn't disappear when the shift is over. In this section, we'll look at the causes of stress, including overtime and shift work. We'll look at organizational stress and discuss the stressors that officers encounter at home. We'll talk about the stress of one's retirement from law enforcement and the loss of law enforcement identity. And we'll look at the officer's role as rescuer, it's part of a peace officer's DNA to help people in need. However, this personality trait that serves so well on the job doesn't always help create the healthiest relationships outside of work. Hey, Dad. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, Mark. How's the job? Things are good. But it's his girlfriend. Allie? Yeah, Allie. She's driving me crazy. I mean, things have gotten out of control and I, I feel like she's ruining my life. How did you and Allie meet in the first place? I was helping out her kid. She has a kid, he's a good kid, but he was in some trouble, so I was there for him. So her and I started hanging out. At first it was, it was fun. I mean, she was pretty normal. We were having a good time. And then out of nowhere, like, it was like right out of left field, she got all jealous. And she accused me, me, of cheating on her. And to top it off, she then took my credit cards and she maxed them all out. And then she called my department to complain about me. Son, I don't know if you remember, but after your mom and I divorced, you know, I was involved in a few relationships and there were some pretty serious issues that made me miserable. Yeah. What I came to realize is that I couldn't fix anyone else. I had to really fix myself first. You need to really take a look at your life and evaluate the decisions that you are making. Well, the first thing I need to fix is those credit cards, so I'll be working a ton of overtime just to fix them. Mark, it just seems like your life is really, really out of balance, really screwed up right now, and you just need to really focus on making better choices. Your job is your job, your life is your life. You can't spend your entire time at the police department. You can't work overtime every day. It's unhealthy, it's not good for your career, it's not good for you, I'm worried about you. When I left the police department, Everything changed. My whole identity was left behind. I was, I was a policeman first, I was a father second. You know, I, I needed to make other choices. I made the wrong choices for a long, long time. And it really made life difficult for me and for you. And, you know, I want you to learn from my example, my bad example. Don't make the same mistakes that I made. You're a better person than that. You're a good policeman, you're a good person. You just need to make better choices for yourself. Okay, thanks. Okay, so in our scenario here, Dad was really concerned about his son working a whole bunch of overtime. What would be his concerns? Why should he be concerned about that? Well, I, I think it's just putting a Band-Aid on it if, if you're just out working the overtime. It's not actually fixing the problem. Um, the problem isn't just the debt, it's all of the emotional stuff that was there also. Yeah, so let's, let's take that a little bit deeper. What are the problems? It's, you've identified it, it's not the debt. What's the real issue with, uh, with the son? What's going on here? Uh, he needs to spend a little more time working on maybe his relationship or deciding whether he wants to be in that relationship and any time that he, additional time he spends at work isn't gonna give him ample time to, 
to maybe focus on those core issues which are, are getting in it. Yeah, because Dad said, you need to fix yourself. He went to the debt. When we talk about fixing ourselves, what are some of those things that we, we need to uh, make sure that we fix and financial, that are okay? Well, financial security usually makes us feel better, so maybe that's why he thought that was the, the quick fix. Yeah, well, definitely the son thought that was, right. that was the, the quick fix. What are some things we can do um, to start making sure we do work on ourselves? What are some of those things? If you've got a spending problem and you, you're going to be working more, but if you're not working on why you're spending the money, yeah, you, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll hit the point where you can't work anymore over time and the bill will just still be there. And, and that's what he's going to run into because mm-hmm. he's not going to deal with the problem. Yeah. The first thing I need to do is get rid of the debt. That's not the first thing he needs to do. Yeah. So as far as fixing himself, he's got to think about the choices he makes, which first starts with the relationships uh, that he picks in the first place. And then there's the decision to spend a certain amount of money. How much am I going to spend? Excellent. Now, he had his dad to go to. So my question to you is, let's kind of maybe start rattling off who are some people you guys have in your life that you start maybe facing a crossroads like this? Older brother. Older brother. Close friend. Yeah. Is, and by the way, is that close friend in law enforcement or outside? Outside. Outside. Yeah. Really kind of a key thing, too, because what does that outside perspective give you? Different experiences, and they're going to interpret what you're telling them in different ways as opposed to if you're sharing with a coworker. Yeah. They, they might... Uh, I don't want to say diminish what you're telling them, but they've been through it too, and it doesn't maybe seem as striking to them. Yeah, I applaud that, that you got to have your outside people. So yeah, we got brothers, we've got friends. Who else can we go to in our family? Or, our, or in our lives, actually? Pastor. A pastor, yeah. Religion, religion can be a huge thing. It doesn't necessarily matter what you believe in, but as long as you're believing in maybe something bigger than you, there's something maybe spiritual that you can kind of go toward. That's, that's a huge part of your balance. Yeah, what else? Who else can we go to? Counselor. Counselor. Yeah. So identify these people preventatively. You know, who are these people in my life that I can go to? Sometimes we'll use, our, we talked earlier about our big part of our identity um, is this profession. At some point, it's all going to end, right? Right. Um, at some point, this profession is going to come to an end. Sometimes, sooner for others, you know, you can go out on an injury. Uh, maybe a lot quicker than you ever anticipated something was going to happen. But let's say, for example, you're going to make this 30-year service retirement. What are some things that we need to start thinking about? If this is a big part of our identity, what are some things we need to start thinking about regarding that transition into retirement? I think you need to have other hobbies or something like that outside of work because I've definitely seen it. My own father retiring from law enforcement, and he doesn't have other stuff going on and he sends me 50 emails a day <laughs> because he doesn't have other stuff going on. And I'm always telling him, you know, hey, you know, find an activity or other people to go travel, go do something. So I think you need to set those things up ahead of time because you're right. At first, it just kind of seems like a vacation, but then the vacation's really long, and what are you going to do after that? Yeah, but that needs to be established early on. It you does. can't have a 30-year career, and then all of a sudden decide you're going to find a hobby and not identify with the job anymore. It's got to happen early on in your career. Yeah. I guess you still have to maintain who you are, aside from maybe, you know, like we said, that identity. Yeah. yeah obvious, obvious regrets. You said I was a cop first, then a father second. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You need to find those priorities. Yeah. When we talk about that identity and that legacy that we want to leave behind, do we want to leave behind that I was a cop, or do I want to leave behind I was, I was a good dad, I was a good good mom, a good son, a good sister, whatever it may be. So, what are some big takeaways from this? You watch this, what are some of the bigger takeaways? Just trying to learn to leave it at the door, if you can. Yeah. It may take time, it may take effort on your part, but it's something you need to focus on, especially as you're, you know, as, if you're a young officer and you're learning things in your career anyway, that, that's something you really want to get a handle on early if you can. Yeah. I think that's probably really the biggest issue, because if you think about all the issues that he's facing, it's because he doesn't have the ability to take all that training, um, take all that identity and set it aside to create the deeper relationship that wouldn't have put him in that predicament in the first place. Yeah. And all the stress and everything associated with the financial problem. Mm-hmm. I think that's the bigger bigger issue. Yeah, and, and th- that is a stellar observation, because if we don't, if we don't foster some of those deeper relationships and some of that, you know, thinking about things a little bit deeper, um, you're going to start facing some of those things that are literally crushing this guy. I mean, you know, the debt, you know, the, the relationship problems, uh, all those things that are very much a part of our career, but doesn't necessarily have to be. 
And uh, we have an opportunity to change that. You know, right here, just by talking about that stuff right here in this setting, we have an opportunity to change that. All right, you guys take care. Be safe out there. Homicides, suicides, fatal accidents, child deaths, you know, all of the things that they are involved in, those extremes play on an officer, on the human side of the officer. Yeah, they're doing their job and they do it well. But if they're not balanced and they don't do something about it, that stress starts pulling and eating away at the altruism. There's also the uh, detachment and emotional disconnect that happens as a defense mechanism to all of the tragedies that they experience on duty. So the emotional detachment combined with the cynicism creates isolation. If you ask police officers, and this is consistent, about the most stressful part of their job, they usually say something about the administration. What does that mean? Um, that means uh, we don't have the ability to control our work environment um, like other people. Most of my officers live in their war zone, which means they live in the communities that they're policing. And so they never really have a time that they're completely relaxed because they go to the supermarket and the same supermarket they, that they drive to to pick up the bread is the same supermarket they may have responded to a call three days ago. This job is psychologically and physically damaging. So it's especially important for police officers to have a balanced life. I think the most important thing a police officer can do to be psychologically healthy and ultimately physically healthy is to develop a rich um, social network, a strong support system. I think family is essential. When they get ready for retirement at the end of their 30-year career and stuff, it's too late to start to develop a balance. It's something that needs to be a lifelong continuous thing that they have always been doing. So it's part of who they are as an individual. Uh, that's healthy because, again, that development of those roles develops that network, that safety net for them. So they have more resources available to them when the issues come up on the job. Stress and psychological issues, anything emotional, um, there's a strong stigma attached to that. It's seen as a form of weakness. And police officers are terrified to have this emotional expression because they're worried that people might assume that they're not fit for duty. Some people that work overtime are doing so to avoid conflicts at home because they know when they get home, it's gonna be another whole uh, bucket load of stress waiting for them. And it's a way of avoidance. Here's what we know. The major factor in our suicides is sleep deprivation. And sleep deprivation, social isolation is a guaranteed cocktail for depression. What happens is with shift work and overtime, um, the body's natural rhythms are, are disturbed. But in addition to that, there's a lot of negative thought rumination, as most humans have uh, negative thought rumination because we're processing what happened during the day or even processing what we watched on the news or, or whatever normal events happen. Sleep to me is probably the number one thing I tell my officers. If you can't change anything else, get seven hours sleep somehow, some way. And you're not going to get seven hours sleep if you're drinking three or four Munsters. So when you're, at, when you're trying to sleep at night and you're processing what has happened, your body is producing adrenaline. It's literally like drinking coffee because it gets you too high up on the arousal curve. And so it increases irritability, it increases uh, anger, it can cause massive problems with sleep. People um, in this line of work, they love to rescue people. They're natural rescuers. And there's this natural connection with the damsel in distress. And the damsel in distress also is looking for the knight in shining armor, so it's this natural connection that is made. The unfortunate consequence to that a lot of times is the damsel in distress is full of psychological problems. And so the psychological problems manifest into the stormy relationship that ultimately causes more stress for the officer. You could do absolutely every single action perfectly and it still all falls apart because of other factors that you had no control over. So realize you're not Superman. This isn't the movies. It, you know, stuff happens. And you have to be able to figure out a way to roll with it in law enforcement to be able to move forward. Do not destroy yourself because of the bad days. 
We're all going to have bad days as we walk our warrior path. Never judge yourself by your worst day. Now think about that. Do we judge athletes by their worst day? No, we judge them by their best day. Never judge yourself by your worst day. You have permission to be human. You have permission to have bad days. That's the only thing we learn from is those bad days. When anybody has um, stress that their normal coping skills can't adapt to, they're going to start seeing a breakdown in just every bit of their wholeness, of their whole wellness, if you would. And that means physically they're going to see some symptoms. They're going to see mentally that they're not functioning right, behavior, relations start breaking apart. It really is a spiral. How we respond to the effects of stress is going to be different in almost every case, unique to the individual. Um, and it may be something that just explodes at one point in time, or it may be a slow uh, general erosion of a person's uh, character and their overall being. We all react differently to stress, and oftentimes we don't recognize the amount of continual stress we're under. We may have an it-couldn't-happen-to-me mentality. Recognizing the symptoms in ourselves as well as in those around us is our responsibility. There are a number of physical indications that stress may be a problem, including headaches, stomach aches, and fatigue. Emotionally, we may be in a bad mood or constantly angry. Cognitively, we could have difficulty concentrating and problem solving. And behaviorally, on the job, there could be increased absenteeism as well as excessive force and aggression. These symptoms indicate that stress may become a problem and it is up to you to recognize them and take action for your own well-being and for those around you. Glad you can make it. I see you got your vitamins. Well, we all can't be as healthy as you. I got a headache. You any aspirin? Man, you're like a hype with these things. You need to get yourself checked out. Don't miss briefing. I won't. It's in 10 minutes. Okay, Dad. I do, officer. Can I see your license and registration, please? Well, I have it here someplace. I, I just used it at the market. I know I have it, unless I left it there. Well, it should be The fact there. that you have no idea what you did wrong really scares me. Did you see the stop sign back there? Well, I thought I stopped. Well, you didn't. Oh, here it is. And registration? What was that? I mean, it's bad enough that you look like crap, you're sick all the time and I always have to cover for you, but now you're gonna harass little old ladies? Really? I mean, I'm not willing to take the complaint on this one. You gotta work on your delivery. Really, what's going on with you? You're popping tums like candy, you're asking me for aspirin all the time? I don't mean to be so harsh on you, man, but do you need help? Yeah. All right, man, well, we gotta snap it together. You're a good officer, man. You're not being your best right now. You're not being your best right now. Okay, so let's kinda take the whole, whole scenario together here. What, what evidence is there that there may be something wrong with this guy? Well, first, the medications, popping tums and aspirin. Okay. Well, and what might that be indicative of? Well, if you have a headache, sometimes it's just a headache, but sure. sometimes it's a bunch of extra stress at home or something that might be causing you to have headaches or upset stomach type things. What are some other alternatives? 
besides maybe some things at home. He's not showing on time for work, you know, missing briefing, as uh, his partners mentioned. Make sure that you're here for briefing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely suggested that maybe he's missed briefing before. You've got these things that indicate something's wrong. Even before, um, he finally asked him. Sitting in that car, he said, there's something wrong. Something wrong with you. And he finally got it out of him. We can tell, right? Mm-hmm. It seemed more like a relationship issue. And the reason why I say that is because the texting part of of the scenario. Usually if it's a relationship deal, it's the stress. Mm -hmm. You're in that phone constantly because the girlfriend or the wife you're going back and forth with. um, That's kind of what I keyed in on. Yeah, great observation. Yeah, I mean, he's he's definitely checked out of work, but he's definitely checked into the into the texting. Yes, sir. And he's checked out of work before he ever gets there. His partner's there. He's prepared. He's, you know, polishing his boots. Mm -hmm. This guy's obviously preoccupied. It's that domino effect. Whether it's a personal problem or a problem at work, it's now it's affecting work as well. If it was a personal problem, um, you know, he's he's a danger danger to himself in a lot of ways, yeah. unfortunately, and and to his partner as well. And to his partners, that's a huge thing because if his head's not in the game, who's it impacting really? Yeah. Well, I, everybody's his partner, his partner, and the public, and the public, and the public. Yeah, sometimes sometimes we forget them. That's that's why we're here in the first place. This is who it's really all for, is it's for our community, and yeah, we got to be on our A game. What are some things maybe in our profession that would prevent us from doing that right thing that his partner did by confronting him? What are some things about our profession that might prevent us from doing that? We don't want to seem weak, possibly. Okay. We don't want to say that either you have a problem or admit that you have a problem yourself. So you're not trying to tell your partner that you trust and you share everything with, like, hey, you have issues, or I don't think you're doing the job. 100%. Mm-hmm. And then if you're the person with an issue, you don't want to sit there and say, well, I have an issue. I'm not perfect. Yeah. So, number one, we don't want to maybe front the person off, right? We don't want to make them, you know, maybe we think if we do deal with it, we're going to make them feel worse. We're going to make them appear weak, like you said. Add to their problem. You know, he, he may feel uh, you're going to make the problem worse in a sense, mm-hmm. although that's not your intention. Well, you could be opening up a can of worms because what if your partner now gives you some information that could like like he said, make the problem worse, uh, something that you got to report to administration that could, in effect, hurt his employment status. Yeah, so we could do the ostrich approach, which yeah. is put her, I see no evil, hear no evil. I don't, I don't even want to hear about it because it could open up a door that I don't even want to be a part of. Yeah, those are all real issues that do oftentimes keep us from approaching someone, running to that confrontation. Isn't it ironic that we have no problem running to the gunfire? No problem taking on that person that wants to fight us or hurt somebody else, and we'll run right to it. But what is it that prevents us from doing that with our own? Emotions. Yeah. Emotions? How so? What do you mean by that? Because when I'm going to go help somebody who's getting maybe beat up on the side of the road, Mm -hmm. there's no emotion involved. I'm just there to you know, kick butt, take names type thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to help them, and then it's going to be over. Mm -hmm. Again, checking the box thing. But when it's somebody that you care about, now you've got this emotional level. And, and sometimes as your partner, maybe you don't want to get to that level. You want to keep things, everything um, friendly and mm-hmm. on this level here of work. Yeah. So. Yeah. Again, kind of maybe going to that superficial level. And yeah, we like that. That's safe. It is. It's a real nice place to be. We know how to handle it. Yeah, we yeah. know how to handle that. Yeah. Great. Okay, so now let's talk about his style. Yeah, he was probably a little harsh on the guy, wasn't he? And and he probably knows him. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's his partner. You're gonna you're gonna know him. And you're gonna know what approach to take. Hope, hopefully, you know, yeah. tactfully enough. Okay. Well, I felt he built him back up at the end when he told him you're a great cop. You know, yeah. because when you're down and somebody's hitting on you more, then it just brings you more down. But mm-hmm. at, at the end, he brought him back up by saying you're a great cop. You just need to get some help. Yeah. Which built, brought him back up. I'm sure. Yes. Sometimes we need to take it on the chin first, right? And then you need someone to to build you back up, and that's what he did. He kind of hit him on the chin first. Hey, I, I see you, I see what's going on, but there was a degree of, of what? What would you kind of, how would you describe his, his approach uh, when it was all said and done? Why is he doing this? Compassion. Yeah. Sure. Concern, yeah. Yeah, it's my partner. I love you, you know, I'm, I, I care for you. These, these, are, these are important things. I got Maybe your I, back. What's that? I got your back. I got your back, big part of it. So it's kind of funny, you mentioned um, emotions. Emotions kind of cause us to maybe run to certain situations. Emotions can also cause us to recoil from those situations. 
Let me ask you this, are we more emotional creatures or are we more thinking creatures? Or thinking, or, or uh, human in nature. Uh, what do you think we are first? Well, we're very emotional big. first, yeah. but as cops, I don't know. I don't know that we are. <laughs> Great observation, because at our very base, what are we? We're emotional creatures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are we asked to do as police officers? Not use our emotions. Yeah. Put on a different, you've got to have the different face. Because, I, I mean, we do. We go to some terrible scenes. You see mm -hmm. some terrible things in this job. And we have to be professional. Mm -hmm. When you see somebody who's just died and you're at a scene, I still have to keep the straight face and check the box. Do all the different things that we have to get done at that scene. And then later, you have all the feelings that come in. But yeah. at the time, when I'm talking to somebody who just lost a family member or something, I can't show them that I'm emotional with them, even though I feel it. Yeah. Our heads have got to be in the game when we're here. We've got to maintain uh, a certain image sometimes, especially on calls for service, because if we don't keep it together, no one's going to keep it together, right? Especially on those real high stress scenes. We need to be that person. But we also are human beings, and we, uh, we can only take so much, right? Let me throw this out. Should we be keeping as much separation between who we are at home versus who we are at work? Should there be, be that much of a separation? In some ways, you have to. Mm -hmm. Again, being a mom, it's not like I could come home and I had a really bad day at work and I just saw somebody's life was taken away from them and I, I can't put that on my three-year-old. Mm -hmm. So you do have to have the separation. And yet, at the same time, you have to be able to talk about those things because otherwise you do, it, it feels like the weight's on your shoulders the whole time if you aren't able to express all of that and tell people how you felt about it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's a tough line of trying to keep them separated. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it, but it is, it's a, it's a tough way of trying to keep things separated, but at the same time making it all work together. Well, in this scenario, we see an officer who's clearly off of his baseline. He's demonstrating a lot of physiological symptoms that are associated with stress. He's got uh, digestive problems. He's got some headaches. He may be having some sleep problems. He's not arriving to work on time. He's got that short temper. Very classic uh, symptomology we're seeing here. And it's a great example of how someone has allowed that to build on themselves. And those things have become their baseline to themselves. I just always... I just must have a bad stomach. I always have a headache. And it becomes normal to them, and they're not, they don't recognize that it's abnormal. The indicators or signs of stress are really um, varied for individuals. It could come out as something like um, irritability. Irritability is one of the most common first signs of stress. Anger management issues. Uh, if you're starting to get a lot of citizen complaints, that should be a red flag to the officer that, mm, Maybe I need to rethink about what's going on in my life. Uh, marital problems that weren't there before and suddenly are starting to show up. Uh, stomach problems, obviously, and just the whole gastrointestinal system, headaches, um, back aches, oddly enough, because when everything tenses up, then that can start causing back problems. They could be really depressed. They could be really angry. They could be handling their calls abruptly. Their performance could decrease lots of different indicators. You just know. When, you're, when you intimately know somebody and you've spent lots of time with them and you've placed your life in their hands and they've placed their life in yours, when they're not right, you just know. The emotional signs, you're gonna see some changes, anxiety, depression, um, irritability, also um, some even crying spells, some apathy. I talk about a feeling of eh, meaning that everything that they used to find fun is now kind of eh, you know, do you want to go to a barbecue? Eh, you know, do you want to go do, you know, go to four-wheeling in the desert? Eh, you know, everything just feels like it's effortful. And that that's some real red flags of, yeah, you kind of need to start putting some things in place. For me, one of my negative behaviors was drinking. So if you're struggling with a with an addiction or in my case alcoholism um being on the 410 shift was great because i would work four days and then i could get drunk for three days and i would go back to work on my monday and no one would know it was my secret and my job really didn't didn't suffer because as law enforcement i think we're able to really mask a lot of our our inner hurt what i find so interesting in this culture is that 
it's really unacceptable to have an expression of emotion. So, so to cry, crying is something that uh, startles a lot of people in law enforcement. It's, it's really viewed negatively. Uh, but you can drink a tremendous amount of alcohol and no one says anything about that. So that's normalized, yet the normal human response uh, is not. Another symptom of stress in an individual is a flashback, also known as re-experiencing. During a flashback, an individual has a sudden, unusually powerful re-experiencing of a past incident or elements of a past event. This re-experiencing can be happy, sad, exciting, or any other emotion. The term is used particularly when the memory is recalled involuntarily and when it is so intense that a person actually relives the experience. When people are having flashbacks, it is a memory of an event that was usually stressful and it flashes, sometimes so much so that you lose a sense of reality that you feel like you're in it. But it's something that you don't control. It's not something you choose to think about. Something in your environment triggered it, and you went there. Very few things in this world scare us more than to think we're losing our mind. You are not losing your mind. By itself, it is not PTSD. It's normal. It's called a flashback, and flashbacks are normal. Now, when the flashback happens, and you try to not think about the incident, that spins you down the path of PTSD. You cannot not think about something. You will literally drive yourself crazy trying to not think about it. You gotta make peace with the memory. You gotta delink the memory from the emotions. Truly, I believe that most mental health comes down to the habits we have. And the good news about that is habits can be changed. And so if you're at a spot where life isn't going really well, change your habits. Start looking at what habits are contributing to your downfall and what habits you need to keep and what areas of your life you need to tweak a little bit. And that's okay. And that's the really good news about it. And unless you have a very serious mental illness, most of it is just about habits. The benefit of taking care of stress as it happens or soon thereafter as you recognize some of the symptoms is it doesn't go the full weight. It won't start impacting your occupation. It won't start bleeding into your interpersonal relationship. It won't impact your ability to enjoy your leisure activities. In the end, what one person is gonna do the best job of taking care of you? What's the one person on all the planet that has your best interests first in mind, and that's you? You have to be your own advocate. You have to be the person who stands up and says, I need help. You have to be the person who looks after yourself. And, and you can't depend on the world to do it for you. Law enforcement career can be very stressful on the family. Um, I think that it's difficult to shift gears when you go from work to home in this line of work. Police officers are the first responders to violence and uh, some of the ugliest tragedies in life. And a lot of people don't like to go home and share that, expose their families to that. So what they do a lot of times is they go home and they're just silent. And so all the spouse really sees is the police officer zoning out in front of the television or numbing out with alcohol. It breaks my heart to see strong warriors, brave warriors, men and women who will be strong in battle, who are blindsided after battle because nobody warned them they might have to be brave after battle. Being aware of the symptoms is one of the first steps in dealing with stress. If we can recognize the signs that stress is beginning to overwhelm our ability to cope with it, we can take the necessary steps sooner rather than later to deal with the issue and minimize the impact. Stress has a profound impact on relationships with a spouse or significant other, as well as with children, other family members, and friends. Fortunately, there are a number of effective and confidential resources available to law enforcement personnel to help deal with the impacts of stress.
I've been looking over the stats. Mm -hmm. What's up with Officer Thatcher? He's lazy. He doesn't do much, and what he does do is sloppy. I had to open my third IA complaint on him. He's a liability. Mm -hmm. His reports are late, they have deficiencies, mm -hmm. and they lack accuracy. I'll take care of it. Thank you. I can't believe this is Thatcher's work. He's always done such a great job. I wonder what's wrong with him. Hey, Thatcher. Hey, it's me, Lilton. Hey, where you at? Hey, when, when you're clear, uh, why don't you swing on by? Uh, let's get a cup of coffee. All right, great. Okay, I'll see you there. Hey, Barry, here you go. Thanks, Sarge, what's up? How you doing? I'm doing okay, why do you ask? <sighs> well, Barry, you know, I, we, we've known each other a long time and I'm just gonna be straight with you, man. You know, we've noticed some deficiencies in your report writing. Your performance is kind of down. I mean, your stats are down compared to the rest of the guys on the shift and what you normally do. I mean, you're a hard worker and I know that. And I know you know about the two IAs, but I just got done with the lieutenant and they told, or she told me about a, another IA that just came in. <sighs> so I gotta ask, man, what, what, what's going on? I have some problems at home. It's my wife. She's leaving me. Man, wow. I, I, I'm sorry to hear that. I, I had no idea. You know, I know, know you guys have been close for a long time and you want to talk about it? She says I work too much. I don't spend enough time at home. We don't communicate anymore. I drink too much. I don't spend any time with the family. And when I do spend time with the family, she says I interrogate them. I don't know what I'm going to do because uh, I think she's forgetting who pays the bills around there. She doesn't understand what I have to go through at work every day. You know, she doesn't understand the stress that I'm under. So, I, at this point, I, I really don't know what to do, Sarge. Man, Barry, I tell you, you know, I, I, I appreciate you having the courage to tell me, because I know that's hard. And I know it's hard because I couldn't do that 10 years ago when I almost lost my wife. I was too embarrassed, and I, wouldn't, and I wouldn't tell people, and I suffered for a long time. And as a result of that, finally I got some help I, from somebody I trusted, connected me with a police psychologist, and we went through some counseling. And I gotta tell you, at first I thought, counseling, what a waste of time. But with a police psychologist, it was somebody who understood our profession, who realized the things that we go through, who's received that training, and has that level of expertise, and it made all the difference. I was a problem in a lot of ways. I was putting up walls between my wife and I, my family and I, my friends and I. And I had done so because of the stress, and I figured I'm just gonna go ahead and close it off, and I'll protect myself that way, and it wasn't working. I thought it was, but it wasn't. And what I finally found out was how to open up, how to let those people back in, the people that are closest to me, how to do some other things besides just this job that would allow me to enjoy life. I tell you, it made all the difference. And today we're happy, have a great relationship with my kids. Whatever we can do to maybe help get you going somewhere along that, I think it'll be a huge, huge difference for you. Where do we start? I don't want to lose my family. Would you be willing to sit down with me and I, I can get you that number to that psychologist. It'll be confidential. I mean, I'll step out. Let's go to my office and make a phone call. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. So, uh, what do you guys think of the sergeant's handling of that one? That's great. A really good job. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Why was it good? What was it that he did that, that made it good? Well, instead of just looking at the activity and thinking, well, this officer is just not trying anymore, he sat down and asked him what was going on. And instead of just saying, oh, okay, well, get your activity up, he actually related to him and kind of gave him a, a start of a solution yeah. instead of just, you know, go out there and forget about your personal life, go out there and actually work on your personal life and I'll help you. Yeah, great observation. What else did he do? I think the, the, 
place where he chose to have the meeting was informal. Okay. Uh, put the employee at ease, and, and I think he seemed genuine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hey, I've known you a while. I think you're that that same. Uh, you're a good cop. The story allowed him to connect. Yeah. The, the officer going through it was more than likely thinking, well, this guy's been through it. He's expressing his pitfalls and what happened, but now providing a solution based on his experience mm -hmm. that's going to allow him to get through it, and that's why the connection was made. Yeah, and he's really not even just giving him a solution. He's like, let me just let me share with you what worked for me. Right. May or may not work for you, but he's bearing a soul too, that sergeant. I mean, he's, he was very vulnerable. So this guy's a sergeant. Why am I showing this to you? How's that impact you? Why, why, would you, why should you care? Might be sergeants one day. I know a few of, of these folks in here are taking sergeant's test, so, yeah. yeah. Exactly. You're all gonna be there one day. All gonna be there one day. Let's take that approach, though. His approach. Is that something that can be directly translated to you as officers? True. I think even officer to officer. So if you see another officer who's having the problems, maybe you get it before it gets to the sergeant level mm -hmm. by just taking them aside. Hey, let's go have coffee. Let's go chat about this is what I'm seeing yeah. and coming across that way. Yeah. yeah great, great point. And that, that's exactly it. Yes, you guys m may be there one day. You, you may be faced with some of these challenging conversations that you have to have um, with one of your officers. You also may have to have one of these challenging conversations with one of your peers. It matters not where you are and where you sit in the organization. What mattered most here? The camaraderie. Yeah. The conversation was had, that it, that it occurred. Mm -hmm. um, I also like that he, he gave him hope. You know, hey, it worked out for me. Get you started. Because that's a big thing, you know. If, I'm sure for him it looks like it's just swirling, you know, just going to come to a, a bad ending mm -hmm. and uh, you know hey he, he even gave him a time frame I think he said it was two years ago or whatever and you know uh, I think that would uh, be a big help to anybody that was facing a problem that you know you'll get through it. What do you think are, could potentially be the positive outcomes of something like this? I guess save his marriage and obviously improve his his work uh, ethic and abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah the organization is going to win too. Now we've got a healthy altogether put together employee that we can count on. That's, that's a big thing. It's a key thing. What has to first occur before Thatcher and the sergeant can even have this conversation? To develop a report. Yeah, absolutely. So we need to start asking ourselves, what are we doing with everybody in our organization uh, to develop that rapport or a relationship with one another so that we can have those, those types of courageous conversations that we've got to have? Because um, you know, that, that's what allowed it to happen. You guys hit the nail on the head. There was already a relationship there in the first place. What are we doing now with our brothers and sisters in public safety to make sure we're building that relationship so when that person does spiral, we can bring them back up. There was one thing at the very end. Okay, the sergeant, has, has, he did some storytelling. He expressed some moments of vulnerability, and he gave him some suggestions. This is what worked for me. But ultimately... What was, what was the key thing that got Thatcher going? He directed Thatcher where he thought he should go. You know, he didn't leave it open and I'll give you a card and yeah. you can call. Now he's going to bring him in and maybe facilitate that and yeah. help, help it to, to move forward. Well, and, and Thatcher made the decision to move forward with it because he could have just as easily said, you know, stay out of my personal life or, mm -hmm. you know, this is mine to deal with. Mm -hmm. And he accepted the help and decided to move forward with it. Did anyone see or identify any weakness here at all? Did you, did you feel that this was weak? Yeah? No. Good. I'm glad because that is absolutely a point of strength. Thatcher and the sergeant are definitely coming from a point of strength. And a lot of times we think we've got to be able to carry these things all by ourselves, and we don't have to. We've got to, you know, probably your greatest victory in life is when you realize you cannot do this alone. So there was that call to action. He said, let's, let's go. And sometimes we'll identify the person's got problems, and then we're like, oh, that's, that, that stinks, man. <laughs> and then we, <laughs> good talk, Russ. And then we just leave it, at, and then we leave it at that, as opposed to that action. The, the sergeant took action. Not only did he take action approaching the employee in the first place, but then said, that follow through, let's go. Let's go do this. We can do this together. You can do this, and I'm going to be there. I'm going to be your guide. In this scenario, we saw the lieutenant looking just at data, 
you know, uh, the number of internal affairs complaints, the number of deficiencies, the reduction in productivity, and didn't really consider there may be something going on with this officer emotionally. Fortunately, the organization had the sergeant, and the sergeant is the closest person to that officer with regard to uh, hierarchy and organizational structure. And the uh, sergeant was able to look at the person as a whole and recognize we need to find out what's the cause of these problems. So we need to start asking some questions. It's a basic preliminary investigation. Sergeants in particular are in position to, to know the people that work for them. And so you have that kind of bird's eye view of, of a whole team of people. And um, a lot of times sergeants will be the first person to recognize signs of stress in people uh, that are working on their team. And that gives that person an opportunity to check in with the, with the officer in, in an environment that's not punitive, that just gives them a chance to, to talk about what may be going on in their life. Well, this is a job that involves um, being able to contain information, being able to make split-second decisions. N you need to learn how to um, identify information, process information, relay information. And with sleep disturbance, or even with post-traumatic stress, when you have untreated post-traumatic stress, a part of our brain called the hippocampus, which is responsible for the consolidation of our memories, it actually shrinks. So there are memory and concentration issues, and it creates uh, all kinds of problems on duty. Occupationally, your attendance is dropping off, or you're overly sick, or you're not as effective, and or not as competent. You don't feel that way. Interpersonal relationships, Friendships either isolate or you're seeking out needy. And in your own love relationships, you could be isolating from them. In leisure activities, you don't find things that you normally liked. You don't find them enjoyable as much. So the things that give you pleasure don't give that same response. I think, unfortunately, the most popular way to cope is alcohol use and also uh, prescription medication use, so things that are acceptable are ways that people cope. Uh, also, anger is something that people in this line of work quickly revert to. And unfortunately, um, we kick those closest to us. So it's usually the spouse or, or family members that get the brunt of our stress. One of the things we hear a lot uh, from officers is, you know, I don't take my stress home. And they say that with kind of a, um, in, in, an emphasis. Uh, the fact of the matter is, we always take our stress home. We cannot separate our work lives um, from our home lives. Sometimes the stress that's put on our officers is that, that they feel like it's an us versus them. That, you know, if you're not wearing my uniform or my badge, you know, you really don't understand me. And quite frankly, nobody understands the law enforcement culture better than someone that's in the law enforcement culture. However, we can't push our families away just because they don't have the badge or the uniform. It really is important that we each take responsibility for our own actions and our own behavior. And if we identify that there is a problem developing, a drinking problem, an anger problem, relationship problems, to be proactive and take care of that because these problems snowball into something bigger and greater. And a lot of times you will end up with a perfect storm of problems um, that cause a loss of functioning. And the problem in this line of work is that you're responsible for other human beings. The effects of stress can have a dramatic impact on one's life and one's career. Perhaps the best way to illustrate the impact of stress on an individual and their law enforcement career is to listen to one officer's story. So you know, I had the benefit of working with Brad White for many years. We worked at two different police agencies together. And I'll tell you, this guy was the most happy-go-lucky guy. He was always had a joke, always had a smile. It didn't seem like anything ever bothered him. It's not instantaneous. It's not one moment. It happens really, really slow. You know, it happens really slow. And, and so slow that you don't, even, you don't even recognize it. You just wake up one day and realize, I've been crying for six months. You know, I'm, I'm in trouble. Brad is the kind of guy that when this happened to him, it was really sobering for me because I realized this could happen to anybody. 
never would I have ever imagined that he would have been struggling with these problems because he was such a great police officer. He made so many great contributions, and he always looked like he had absolute control and a handle on everything. If, if I can just get through today, tomorrow's going to be just fine. I mean, I can, I can remember thinking that for so long every night, going, if I can just make it through today, you know, if I can just sleep tonight, tomorrow's going to be better. This is going to get better. I'm, I'm going to feel better. From the outside, Brad looked great. He performed great. He, he was a fantastic police officer. He made great contributions. And I would have never guessed that he was struggling so deeply. I would go to bed at night, and, and my heart would beat so hard and so loud and for so long that I would never go to bed. So where Brad got into trouble, um, he talks about how he didn't want to talk to his wife or anyone about what was happening to him. Through the whole police career, there was never a good time to come home and talk about, you know, the toddler that was killed in that car crash. It just wasn't. So you, it's an odd job in the fact that you go through a day's work and what's normal to you after years and years, um, it's not a normal environment that you go home and I would never talk about anything. It was really amazing how little we talked about my work. It took a lot of courage for him to take that first step and to come into counseling. I think the only thing that would have worked for me if there was something that had been set up that I was forced to participate in that I didn't have a choice. Because I don't think I ever would have. And I know I didn't. I never would have reached out with this. I never would have said, I'm dealing with this, help me. There are hundreds of officers uh, in Brad's position, maybe thousands, silently suffering and scared to take that first step. I went through this, you know, and I don't, I guess I just don't want anyone else to go through it. I just don't want anyone else to have to go through it. And I don't know if they'll have the perfect infrastructure like I did. So, I mean, this is all I got left to give. It's the only way now I'm associated with police work. I think the people I see that are most successful at this career, and by success I mean they got out of it healthy, they lived a very long life enjoying their retirement, and then maybe they started a second career. These are the people that approached their job with a sense of balance and understanding. They weren't just police officers. You're in a career that deals with a lot of stress, and it's abnormal stress. It's not what the general public is going to deal with. So your resiliency and um, your skills at dealing with that are crucial. Keeping one's life in balance enhances that resiliency. What you got to do is identify the things in this world you can control. And what's the one thing in this old world that we can't control? Ourselves. Developing coping and resiliency skills are important components in successfully dealing with stress. Understanding how stress impacts us and taking responsibility for one's own wellness is key in coping with the effects of stress. There are a number of effective resources available to assist with coping skills. These resources include the debriefing process, peer-to-peer -peer counseling, interacting with chaplains, as well as access to therapists and counselors specifically trained to work in the law enforcement environment. While these resources are often readily available, it is up to the individual to take advantage of them and utilize them when needed. 911 emergency. My husband is John Smith. He's one of your officers. He's in the bathroom with his gun. He's been drinking and he says he's gonna kill himself. John? Yes. Okay. Are you sure he has the gun? Ma'am, what was that? He shot himself. Okay. Is, is he breathing? I don't think so. I've got help on the way, okay? Where is his injury? <laughs> okay. Help's, help's gonna be there in a moment, okay? Do you think he's beyond any help? 
okay. Just, just stay on the line with me, okay? They'll be there in a moment. Just, just stay with me, okay? That sounds like a good plan. Let's just make sure we get off on time. So what are you going to give me, two strokes a hole? That's fair? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, come on, you better brought your wallet with you, because I'm going to take your money today. What you really? got? Oh, hey, t take a look at that. It, isn't, isn't that? Yeah, that's John's address. Self-inflicted gunshot? Oh, my, oh my God. Me? No, uh, let's go, let's go, let's go. Three Frank 11, show us around. Let's go. Hey, Mike. Hey. How are you? Hey, Jane, how are you? Good, hey. good. good. Oh, hey, what's going on? I'm glad you finally got here. Yep. How are these going? Good, good, good. Smells good. What you cooking? I got some ribs going on. You want a beer with those ribs? Please. Uh, Absolutely. I would love a beer. What's going on? Oh, Did God. you guys have a fight before you got here? Well, no. This is just how it's been for the past six months. It's changed. Okay, now, wasn't that around the time that we lost John? I don't know, but I... I just can't even imagine what it must have been like for Mike and Joe. Can you imagine being the first ones there oh. after John committed suicide? <sighs> hey, do you think maybe that's what's what's been going on with him? Maybe. Uh, well, I don't know, but Joe, Joe was really bad after that happened. You know, we thought the stress debrief would be enough, but I am telling you, it wasn't. I remember Mike talking about the debrief, but he said it would be a waste of time. <laughs> well, I'm not going to lie to you. It was definitely a process. Oh. You know. Joe started talking to the chaplain, and he was great. He was, he was so helpful. He gave him, like, several great referrals. So then Joe started counseling. And I have to tell you, at first, it didn't kind of seem like it was working, but he finally found a therapist who actually has experience dealing with law enforcement, and it turned everything around. How are you and Cindy doing? <sighs> Not good. These, these past couple months have been rough. She's constantly on my case. You know, I don't understand it. We used to be best friends, and now she's just driving me crazy. Man, you know, you guys, you guys used to be so awesome together. Um, you know, Jane and I had some, some of the same issues after, uh, after the incident with uh, John. Um, you know, and I noticed after that incident occurred and there was a debriefing, you didn't show up. Uh, did you seek any type of peer counseling or anything over that? Seriously? Yeah, I mean, seriously. That's, that's not for me. Well, you know, I, I know you may think it's not for you, but, but I talked to several people about it, and I just kind of learned that it's something that we really can't take upon ourselves. We really need to talk about it and deal with it, and that stuff just doesn't go away. You really need to address it. So everything I say, people are going to know what I'm talking about? I mean, do you trust these people you're talking to? You know, that was a concern of mine, too. And um, after I've talked to these people and some of the very... Things that I've said to them, I've never heard them be repeated to anybody. Um, so yeah, I feel very confident that uh, everything I say uh, stays within the, this person I'm talking to, and they do not uh, say anything outside my little group. Yeah, I know one thing. I, I have to do something because I can't continue like this. Yeah, you, you and Cindy are such a great couple and such good friends of ours. We, we sure don't want to see you guys split up or have any other issues. We'd, I'd really like to see you take care of it. Yeah, I, I really want to make this work, too. I appreciate your, your advice on this. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate your, your advice on this. Yeah, absolutely. So, let me kind of throw this one out there. How, uh, how plausible is this that something like this could happen in our own agency? Very plausible. Yeah. I actually went through a very similar situation, so it definitely can happen. Yeah. So, if this is something that's plausible, it can happen. We know it happens. We have somebody in the room who has experienced something like that. Um, what can we do to maybe start preventing things like this from happening in the first place? What are some of the things that we can do? Talking to each other okay. when we notice something's wrong. Right. So instead of just ignoring that they're having an issue, bringing it up to them and showing that you are a support for them mm -hmm. so that they don't feel that they're alone and end up in this type of situation. Excellent point. So the power of those human relationships are really, really key. We talk a lot about being a family, um, but are we really doing that? Um, you know, maybe sometimes we're more of a dysfunctional family <laughs> than anything else. Um, but you know, it's it's a goal that we can work toward. We talk a lot about family. Um, 
You know, are, are we doing that? Excellent point. Yeah, building those relationships. What else can we do to prevent stuff like this from happening? Well, I think, I think it starts way before just recognizing a problem. I think that camaraderie and that bond is extremely important. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes you don't just necessarily get that at the office. I think mm-hmm. sometimes doing out, you know, outside things like a lot of us do, you get to really know somebody. Yeah. And they can use that, use you knowing and trusting the relationship as that support when things like that mm-hmm. start to occur. And that, when you know somebody well, those signs are easily you know, recognizable. Yeah, yeah. Once the closer we get with each other, the more we know each other, the more that we can kind of run toward that, that potential issue and, and deal with it before it be, blows up right. you know, to something that's, that's much bigger. What else? What else are some things organizationally? You as individuals, what can we do? I think breaking down that bad stigma of counseling because we're always supposed to be so tough. We're mm-hmm. always supposed to have that straight face on. And a lot of times when these type of situations or any type of bad situation, we don't want to do the debrief. We don't want to go talk to a counselor. There's kind of that bad stigma of it, and we should break that. We should say that it's okay to go get counseling because it really is, and it's so helpful. Having been through that, it was really quite helpful to go and talk to somebody and realize that your feelings aren't unnormal. Yeah. Is that a way to say it? <laughs> I, I'm so glad you said that because so much of what we're talking about is taking, is this a pretty abnormal situation? Pretty extreme, right? Right. Pretty abnormal situation going on here. This is not something you see and experience every day. And so these are very normal reactions to a very abnormal situation. You, you hit the nail on the head. This is, and that's what counseling does, is counseling is going to normalize a lot of it for us. Speaking of normalizing, we also need to start normalizing that counseling and debriefing and talking about this type of stuff is also normal too. That we, the conversation needs to begin right here. We need to have it right here. So we need to educate. You know, not only do we need to create that this is a normal environment, but we need to educate about what the reality, what really will happen if you go seek counseling. You know, um, you know what are maybe some myths out there? You know, about counseling. The confidentiality. Yeah. That was that was a big part too. Is mm-hmm. Knowing that everything that you are going to say to that counselor, or peer support, or whatever is going to stay there, and it's not going to be what everybody talks about in briefing the next day. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's the cornerstone of it all is that confidentiality and, and knowing and feeling within the organization that what is said in that debrief or what is said with that counselor or what's said with that chaplain is going to stay there. How do we, how do we know that that trust is there? Those that have been through it, sharing it, uh, as uh, the other officer did in the video, which is, well, I went through it and I was concerned, yeah. but I've had a positive experience. I've never heard anything else. Um, yeah, that... that needs to, you know, just as uh, she has indicated, that it, it worked the way it's supposed to. Yeah. We've had our officers that have all walked through the fire, right? They've all got walked through the fire. They've gotten burned. Identify who those people are that might play a big role in being that support system, that, that type of peer support. Do you think the officer, the one who is kind of mentoring the other officer on maybe getting some counseling and, you know, talking to him about the value of a debrief, uh, do you think he struggled through that process? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What do you What do you think are some of the things he struggled with? Feelings, emotions. Opening up. Yeah. Yeah, opening up the feel, even making the decision to do it in the first place, right, guys? You know, we like to push the emotions aside usually, right? And in counseling, you're having during that process, those feelings are thrown right in your face. You have to deal with it. You have to confront it. You show up on scene, you see that your partner has taken his own life. What are maybe some things you start thinking about? Why? What did we miss? How did it happen? How could we let it happen? Yeah, start blaming yourself maybe. Absolutely. Yeah, so so all these things, these real destructive things that can start happening to us following these traumatic incidents. And you know what the number one thing is that helps people be resilient during these times? What do you think it is? Think of all the bad times you've gone through in life. What was something that got you through it, that made you resilient? Support. 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 Human relationships. Connecting with another human being. That's it, in a nutshell. And that's essentially what counseling and peer support and chaplains, that's what they're there to do. They're there to establish that human connection so that you can be resilient because you're going to be thrown into the fire. Every officer is exposed to critical incidents, traumatic incidents. And some of the officers are very good about recognizing that they need to work through these issues. I've had several officers who have said, 
I'll come and do the debrief, but I really don't need to do the exercises because I'm not being uh, negatively affected by the event. And the next day I call them and they didn't sleep at all that night because we try to debrief them the same day or within a very short period of time. The point of a debrief, the benefit of a debrief, is it takes you through the event, usually takes you through all the sensations, all the five senses. So you can identify what you tasted, what you smelled, what you saw, what you heard, what you felt even. In the future, if you experience one of those five senses, it might be the trigger that takes you into a flashback. And so by doing that in a debrief, we've now inoculated you. The people that come and use the tools that we give them, they have a much better chance of not suffering any of the negative consequences associated with that stress. Well, I will tell you that the best way to protect yourself from psychological and physical damage in this line of work is to prioritize your family. So taking the time to prioritize them and to make sure that your home life is, is healthy, uh, I would recommend communicating with your spouse and your kids. And when you have those angry outbursts, apologize to them, talk to them. There's 750 police officers in the city of Fresno who can all be cops, but there's only me who can be a father to my children, a grandfather to my soon-to-be grandchild. That is a bigger job than the badge. That's who will define who I am when I'm gone. So one of the supports available to many police officers are peers. And peers can be a formal peer support program, which is absolutely invaluable for police departments to have. But every time uh, an officer is talking to a fellow officer um, while having a cup of coffee, just kind of um, decompressing after a call, that's peer support. That's one of the best things uh, that, uh, that's one of the most helpful things for officers is to get that peer support. The best of the people are the ones that take that tragedy and then help somebody who has gone through something similar. You get stronger, you get healthier, and you help somebody else because they look at you and go, well, you look so normal, and you went through something similar. What we don't realize is peer-to-peer -peer is healing and empowering in two directions. The process of helping others is one of the most powerful tools to allow you to have your own recognition of where you are and what you can do. In the end, one of the greatest tools we have to help ourselves is to help others. Peer-to-peer -peer counseling and working with others are powerful tools to help better deal with stress-related issues. There are also a number of things we can do as individuals to help cope with stress. These include mindfulness, visualization, and breathing exercises. One key advantage to these three techniques is they can all be utilized in any situation at any time on the job or elsewhere. I would encourage people to, to, to look into mindfulness, but essentially what it is, it's focusing your attention on what's happening right now. Um, not what happened yesterday, or not what's gonna happen tomorrow, but right now, how are you feeling? What are, what are your bodily sensations? What are you thinking about? And the cool thing about mindfulness is that you can practice it anywhere. One of the things that uh, we learned is the uh, uh, visualization. We visualize everything we do um, and we visualize it in a, in a successful manner. Uh, we do that, we think about scenarios, we brief scenarios every day, we talk about it, we talk about the positive outcomes of it. So when we see it and we're under extreme amounts of stress, we just actually do it like that and things work out for the best. The breathing exercise is you gaining conscious control of that unconscious part of your body. And what we teach is a four count in through the nose for a four count, hold for a four count, out for the lips for a four count, hold for a four count, again and again. I think it's very personal what makes us feel better. I think some people uh, love to exercise and that's their release. Other people really enjoy uh, cooking or gardening. So it's very individual. What is cathartic to you might not be cathartic to someone else. So it's very important to identify what those things are and to engage in those activities on a regular basis. Another valuable resource available to law enforcement personnel are chaplains and the chaplaincy program. I think the chaplain's role in law enforcement is really the strength of the chaplaincy comes on five pillars. And these pillars are being accessible, being available, being professional, being credible, 
and being confidential. Uh, we're not in there as pastors or priests or rabbis or anything like that. We do bring a spiritual component with us, but chaplains are primarily first responders to the first responders. I really would encourage departments to see the value of getting chaplains and peer support and even mental health involved at the beginning of these critical incidents instead of waiting and seeing the reactions because that's a lot of hours that have gone by. Why would we want anybody to deal with something that they could be better quicker? You know, dispatch is a critical part of what we do. We couldn't do the job without them. There's an enormous amount of interdependency there. We also have to recognize that they go through a lot of the same stressors and pressures that we do. Just because they weren't on scene doesn't mean that they aren't experiencing the event emotionally. They don't know if somebody's going to be screaming for help or screaming because of anger. They have no idea what's going to hit their, their ear and what they're going to imagine. You see, if you can imagine it, you can feel it. And in their mind's eye, they are seeing what that person is saying. And sometimes, quite frankly, that's worse than the reality. In this section, we'll talk about one of the most important but often overlooked parts of the law enforcement team, the dispatchers. Dispatch is a critical element of the law enforcement family, and there is an enormous amount of interdependency between officers and dispatchers. Dispatchers experience many of the same stressors as officers. However, unlike officers, dispatchers don't often experience the same closure with an event as officers do. And many times they are unaware of the final outcome of the calls they've handled. This uncertainty can lead to critical incident stress and cumulative stress challenges for dispatchers. It's important to let dispatchers know what a critical part of the team they are and how much they're appreciated. 911 emergency. My husband is John Smith. He's one of your officers. He's in the bathroom with his gun. He's been drinking and he says he's gonna kill himself. John? Yes. Okay. Are you sure he has the gun? Oh God, he did it. <laughs> Ma'am, what was that? Okay. Uh, is, is he breathing? I don't think so. I've got help on the way, okay? Where is his injury? <laughs> okay. Help's, help's going to be there in a moment, okay? Do you think he's beyond any help? Yes. Okay. Just, just... Stay on the line with me, okay? They'll be there in a moment. Just, just stay with me, okay? Hey, it's been a couple of months since we lost John. I'm just checking in with everybody to see how they're doing. How are you doing? Well, I've had good days and bad days. Um, first, I was really struggling with the feeling like I could have done something differently. Um, I was having trouble sleeping and um, just seeing my workstation uh, um, just made me think about that call and um, it was really hard putting my headset on. Um, but it was tough, but it is slowly getting better. What's making the difference? Well, I started seeing a counselor and she's uh, helped me to realize that there was nothing I could have done to save John. Um, she's also taught me some breathing exercises, which have really helped with that anxiety that I've been feeling at my workstation. Um, she's uh, also helped me to start journaling, and um, I've gotten myself into uh, an exercise routine. And I cut back on caffeine, which has really helped with my sleep. Good job. Really good job. I'm, I know it's been tough on everybody around here, and I'm really glad to hear you're working through it. Um, 
you know, thank you. It's it's actually been really great uh, as well, just the support that I've gotten from the department because I have been included in all the same processes as the officers. And um, it's been really, really good for me. Um, I saw James in the hallway the other day and he told me that I did a good job and gave me a big hug and it really meant a lot to me. Fantastic. It really meant a lot to me. So let me ask you this, how much uh, thought do we typically give to how these same types of calls might affect and impact our dispatchers? Not Probably very much. Not so much. Not as much as we should. Why do you think that is? What is it about um, either the nature of our profession or what it is or how we do it that prevents that from happening? I think we don't see them. Yeah. They're behind the scenes sort of, so we don't. Though we hear them, we don't see them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that whole separation is that's a key thing. You know, the old saying, out of sight, out of mind, right? So what are some things, either at a patrol level or organizational level, that can be done to make sure that um, we are including them, that they feel like they're a part of, you know, she said, I felt like I was a part of the entire uh, process that all the officers went through as well. What, what, what's the one thing we do have at our disposal that we can used to make sure that we are connected with them. MDC. We got the MDC. Yeah, send a message. That was a really nice job uh, on that call. Well done. Fire them off a text if you know them at a, on a personal level. We're there on the call. We're there. We're dealing with it. We're handling it. It's a messy situation. Um, are they, do they have any less of a skin in the game than we do, or what do you guys think? They don't have the visual that we have of being, but they have... They're hearing all of it because mm -hmm. they'll hear us when we're putting stuff out, and they also hear when people are calling in and giving them details. So they they don't always know what's going on because we may not update them, um, maybe sometimes as often as we should, okay. letting them know. So I, I think for them, they probably get a lot of the anxiety of wanting to know what's, gonna, what's happening and what's going on because they're not there to visually see it. Beautiful point. You have a call. Um, you have, you have this scene, you have this situation. Let's take the officer who's on scene. What is the one thing that's probably, you, you have your partner, he's down, uh, and he's ob obviously deceased. What's the one thing that's probably driving that officer nuts? It's not you can't do anything. Can't There's nothing I can do. Excellent. Can't fix it. There's nothing I can do. I'm, I have no control. I don't control the situation anymore. Let's go over here to dispatch. Are they experiencing the same thing? Yes. Yeah. Remember, they're usually the one calling the shots. They're the ones that decide if you guys go code three. You know, they're the ones that are, are dispatching you and controlling and coordinating certain things. So control is, and, and, and predictability is a big part of what they do, too. So, yeah, you keying in on that is very, very key to know that a big part of our profession is that that lack of control and helplessness um, impacts us at a patrol level just as much as it does a dispatcher. So, what did you guys think of the uh, the dispatch supervisor's uh, handling of this? I think that's great that they checked in later. Um, having gone through the same thing, an officer committing suicide, um, it really didn't seem to affect me as much until a year out. And then mm. all of a sudden at the one year anniversary, bam, it hit me like, wow, this really happened. Yeah. And so I think the checking in at three months, at six months, at nine months, at a year, and just kind of knowing where everybody's at in their own way of handling it. Yeah, and yeah, you brought up some really key points. Number one, yeah, those anniversary dates are key. Um, also where people, where it occurred, you know, knowing that that may be a trigger for some people, going right back to that same event. How many times we go by the same call over and over and over again that impacted us? Yeah, being aware of that as, a, as both a supervisor and as a peer, how that might impact people. What else? She followed up with everybody, so it wasn't just the person that took the call, it was all of the coworkers, and even she not only just asked, you know, are you doing okay, but she, when you gave your answer, she kind of had you explain a little bit more. So she, it seemed that she actually cared. She was not just asking so she could mark it off of her list of things to do. She was asking because she wanted to know. Yeah, excellent point. Number one, if we're going to do this, let's do it for everybody. So we're not just saying, uh, hey, uh, you look crazy. Come on over here. <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing that. We're, we're including everybody in, in the process, like, like, you know, we should be used to calling it now. It, it is a process. Yeah, and, and just the way she asked questions. What did you guys notice about how she asked? 
she came across to me more um, not as a supervisor, but more as a friend or, mm -hmm. um, it, and to me, almost motherly, like mm -hmm. almost like, I really want to know how you're doing. How's yeah. and and praising her also in what she's done on her own steps, which was good too. Yeah, a lot of affirmation, a lot of praising. Well, I'm really proud of what you did and how you've dealt with it. Not just handling the call, how you're dealing with it afterwards, and, and having the courage and the resilience to get through it. Yeah, that af that affirmation and, and that type of support really huge. Is this only a dispatch supervisor's job to follow up? Is it only her job to do that? No. Who, who else's responsibility should it be? What can be ours as road right. officers? Yeah. What was the thing that really impacted her? The, I mean, hub, the, hub, the hub in the hallway. From, yeah. But there are those things that we can do to break down some of those walls and, and cross some of those boundaries. So uh, latch on to those opportunities. You guys have identified them. You see them. It's, you guys all know it in, inside your heart. Just have the courage to go ahead and follow through and, and follow up on that. So in this scenario, we see this dispatcher was pretty seriously affected by this very traumatic event. And she responded very favorably to just a, a hug in the hallway. And so we all need to recognize that they're part of the team. Send them a text, send them an MDC message, tell them they did a great job, tell them you appreciate them, tell them you, you couldn't have done it without them. Remember that they play that crucial role and acknowledge that. As supervisors, we try to do a good job of acknowledging our officers when they do a good job. We need to do a better job of acknowledging our dispatchers, but it's also the responsibility of the officers themselves to build those effective relationships. You know, unfortunately, dispatchers are some of the most underappreciated people in the department. They have an essential role in law enforcement, um, but unfortunately, a lot of times, the focus is placed on the, the officer. So the dispatcher doesn't have any closure and is oftentimes not included in the debriefs. One of the critical pieces of the healing equation is the debriefing. And it is terribly important that the dispatcher be there as well. When we do our debriefings, when we bring the team together, when we talk about what happened, when we fill in the memory gap, when we sort out the memory distortion, when we multiply our joy and divide our pain, pain shared is pain divided, joy shared is joy multiplied, that dispatcher really needs to be a part of that equation. I think it's so important for um, a dispatch supervisor to track what's going on with their dispatchers, to, to be aware of what's happening, and to do something as simple as saying, hey, um, I know you were on this call the other day, or you dispatched this call, how are you doing? Many departments have um, peer support people who are dispatchers, and if they don't, they should consider doing that because peers are uh, particularly helpful for dispatchers, and, but they also have professional counseling, they have EAP, um, and that's all available to them as well. As with dispatchers, the resources of peer support counseling, professional counseling, and EAP are likewise available to all law enforcement personnel. Our job is to serve our officers so that they can serve the community. And we need to constantly be working on keeping them healthy, emotionally, physically, keeping them satisfied and content, meeting all of their needs, because they're the ones that are making contact with the community multiple times a day. You have a lot of options, actually, if hopefully your department has a peer support program. So the, a peer support counselor can be a very good resource for you. Um, you can ask to see if there is a police psychologist affiliated with your department. Uh, you have the chaplain's program. You have EAP. Um, if it is an on-duty incident, you can go to Human Resources and file a workers' comp claim, and then they can provide a referral to a psychologist that accepts workers' comp or a psychiatrist that accepts workers' comp. One of the most common misconceptions about professional counseling is that it's somehow not confidential and that it's going to get back to the police department. And that's just simply not the case. Um, if a mental health professional discloses without your permission anything that you say in a session, they're at risk for losing their license. Just like medical doctors or any kind of other specialists, you're not always going to click with the first person that you go to when, you, when you're seeking therapy. And so it's important for officers, if they go to a therapist and it just isn't really working for them, try somebody else. So asking the questions are, do you have police experience? And that doesn't mean that they have an uncle that is a police officer. That means that they have worked with police officers or they were trained at a police department 
or maybe they were police officers themselves at some point. If we could educate people in, into um, preventative uh, work and help, and maybe getting a yearly checkup, an annual checkup, the same way you would with a dentist or a, a medical doctor, go see a, a psychologist once a year. Just debrief all of the incidents and the things that have, that have gone on. I tell folks, don't wait until you're really broken. Come in when things are starting to stress you a little bit and you just need to decompress a little bit because that's a lot easier to fix than when you've waited six years and now your plate is so full of problems that you don't even know where to start. Remember, if a counselor or therapist is not working out, it's okay to find another. And look for those professionals with an established track record of working with law enforcement agencies. There are a number of other resources available to law enforcement personnel that can assist with stress management. These include 12-step programs, the Badge of Life, West Coast Post-Trauma Retreat, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, Cop to Cop Suicide Prevention, ICISF, or International Critical Incident Stress Foundation, Resiliency Sciences Institute, and Vet Center. In addition, there are a number of state and national resources available to law enforcement personnel for assisting with stress management, as well as resources created specifically for dispatchers. This course is designed to be facilitated in a group setting. Before conducting a group training session, you should review and become familiar with the material in this program. Open and print the facilitator guide and go through the material yourself before putting the course on for others. As the facilitator, your job is to engage your students in constructive, free-flowing discussion on the key learning points in this training topic, stimulate critical thinking and situational awareness in the group by viewing the scenarios, expert interviews, and discussion videos. Questions and activities are provided to promote group interaction and discussion on the training topic. Customize the learning experience by applying your agency policy and procedures to the training concepts. Segments in this program accommodate shorter training periods, such as during roll call training sessions. Track your students' progress through the entire program. Once the students have successfully completed the program, submit your training roster to post for CPT credit. Following this plan will help to create an environment for the debate of ideas, sharing of wisdom based on experience, and encourage a greater understanding of local policies and procedures. We wish you and your agency all the best in successfully implementing this program. This course is designed to be facilitated in a group setting. However, when that is not possible, here are some instructions for getting the most out of this training program so that you may receive continuing professional training or CPT credit. Let your supervisor know that you will be viewing the program. This will give them some time to review the course themselves and be prepared to discuss it with you later on. Open and print the student workbook so you can take notes and fill out responses to the questions and activities. Think about how the training concepts presented apply to your agency policy and procedures. You may view the scenarios, expert interviews, and discussion videos several times to assist you in providing responses. Keep track of your progress as you complete segments in the course. When you have finished the entire program, inform your supervisor that you would like to review the course with them. Send them your completed student workbook prior to meeting so that they have a chance to review your responses. Your supervisor may require additional work or feedback from you before giving CPT credit. It is up to their discretion to determine whether you have adequately completed the course. Following these instructions will give you the best opportunity not only to receive CPT credit, but to grasp the training concepts, benefit from the experience of others, and apply the training and experience to your local policy and procedures. We wish you and your agency all the best in successfully completing this course. Stress is an everyday component of any law enforcement career. Understanding the causes, recognizing the symptoms, and knowing when and where to seek help when your body can't cope with the stress you're experiencing are all key components in successfully managing stress. So my hope as a chaplain for every officer 
is that you take this law enforcement career and you write it out as much as you can until you're ready to retire. And then when you retire, that you just have a wonderful life with whatever you want to do healthy, with the family and friends, and just literally enjoy life after the fact. To every one of our magnificent cops out there who bear the shield with honor, who bear the star and bear the shield, that little chunk of armor, the modern knights, the paladin, thank you for walking out the door every day to lay your life on the line. We have come to the end of our training. On behalf of the Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training, we would like to thank the many officers, subject matter experts, agencies, and individuals who have contributed to the creation of this training program on stress management. Please take a moment to view the credits that follow and hear the story of Berkeley officer Jeff Shannon's father as Jeff explains the effect of stress on his father's law enforcement career. One of the best examples for me personally of police stress was my father. He was um, uh, an MP in the Army in the, uh, and served in Korea, a real tough guy. Um, he uh, got a job with the California High Patrol, extremely proud of that. Um, and uh, I remember when I was a kid, we would have people come over that he worked with. We'd have barbecues in our backyard. It would be a big jolly time, people laughing and drinking. Um, they smoked cigarettes a lot back then. And then he had something uh, that he wasn't ready for. And what that was, uh, was he had a, um, a back injury that he, he sustained on the job, led to a, a medical retirement. And that really changed his life. It changed his life um, first by this idea that, of the police family. Um, he found that, um, and I re remember this, that the people that used to come over and hang out no longer did. He, um, he became much more isolated and withdrawn. Uh, over a period of years, um, he, he didn't have the tools that he needed to get through the stressful uh, transition from career, also dealing with chronic pain. He just didn't have the tools. Like so many officers back then, and sadly today, his toolbox of stress reduction included Pall Mall Golds um, and uh, drinking and um, very isolated. He divorced, um, chain smoking. And he wound up uh, dying at the age of 57 uh, of coronary heart failure. And at that time, he was living by himself uh, in a one-bedroom apartment. And I saw him a few weeks before he died. He had lost all contact with his children, except for occasionally, like, my visiting him. And so he was living a, a really a life that nobody would want to live at the end. And, and for me, that was... Um, of course, I didn't have the words for that all, all back then when I was uh, that age, but he was really a textbook case of police stress in terms of not having the coping that he needed, um, the isolation, the kind of I don't need help mentality. Um, that all really kind of destroyed the quality of his life and ultimately it um, reduced the, the time of his life.